lecture today. I think this is going to be the last endowment lecture for this academic year. And it is the second in Nirmal Bits endowment lecture after we revived our endowment lecture. Endowment lectures are the key elements in the life of academician, particularly for the theological community like us. It offers an opportunity to learn more things from diverse disciplines. Hence, Enhance diversity in a multidisciplinary approach. Gurukul today having Nirmal Mint's endowment lecture on his birthday, 11th February. This is his 96th birthday, and we are having an endowment lecture on the theme Identity Crisis and the Adivasi Awakening. Our dear Bishop Emirates uh, graciously accepted to deliver us to today the lecture. So I welcome you, sir, on behalf of Gurukul Lutheran Theological College. We'll start the endowment lecture with a word of prayer. I request Reverend Dr. Babu C to kindly lead us in opening prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your moment. And we thank you for your continuous journey with us. You have been so gracious to us, God, in reviving many of the events, programs that were in the past. And uh, we have we are able to successfully conduct many endowment lectures in the past. And with this God today, we remember a great leader, Bishop uh, Nirmal Minj, whom God we take as our model for tribal and Adivasi theology and who restored, God who gave us the consciousness, the importance of identity of our own. God, this day, we thank you for his life and ministry, the work that he has left behind. We pray that God, as we ponder upon the legacy of Dr. Nirmal Minch, and as we listen to Dr. Busi Sunil Banu, former moderator of ALC, God speak to us and enable us, motivate us, and help us to look back. And God help us to reclaim our identities. And also God help us to be open to the challenges that are be before us. God, we pray, let, let this day be challenging to us and the lecture will be a challenge, challenging and motivating to all of us. Bless the gathering, those who are here and online. We come in and commit each one of us into the care. In Jesus name we pray, amen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I request our distinguished guest, Right Reverend Dr. Busey Sunil Banu, sir, to kindly come forward and occupy the sir, seats that are allotted here. And I also request our dear principal and the respondent, Reverend Dr. Uh, Jacob Sundar Singh, sir, also kindly come forward and kindly occupy the seats that are allotted to you here. And now, Reverend Dr. Sangram Baspatari, principal of our college, will be welcoming our chief guest now. Good morning, dear friends. Indeed, it's a great joy to have this endowment lecture on an Adivasi theologian, political and social activist, Bishop Nirmal Mins. And we, it's good that we follow their legacy, stalwarts of Indian Christian theology, stalwarts of our churches in India, and in particular, Gurukul Lutheran Theological College and Research Institute. I welcome those who are present here physically in Swan Memorial Chapel of Gurukul, as well as all the participants online. Very, very special welcome to the family members, Dr. Nijar, Dr. Jakmak and children, 
I guess it is almost midnight for you, but I'm glad to see you that you are attending online and also other family members. Okay, Professor Sonazaria Mins, Vice Chancellor of Siddho Kanhu Murmu University, Dumka. She is very busy, but I understand Dr. Betuel Ekka, you are with us online. So we welcome you and also other family members, Dr. Santidani Mins. I guess you will be joining a little later. And also Dr. Atul Tiga from CMC Velour. And Mrs. Akai Mins and then family. And then especially though she cannot see, she cannot attend online or any mode. The wife of Led Bishop Mins, Mrs. Paraclet Mins. So we welcome all the family members. And then I request Dr. Betuel Ekka, convey our love and regard to your Amma. So I welcome you all. And in return to Gurukul from family side, I also extend the greeting sent from the family, particularly expressed by Dr. Nijhar Mins and Dr. Jagmak Ekka. From all the family members, sisters, and then son-in-laws of Bishop Mins and nine grandchildren. I extend greetings to Gurukul community and all well-wishers and partners physically presenting here and also online receive their greetings. Now in particular, it is my pleasure to welcome our speaker for this endowment lecture, the former chairperson of Gurukul College Council, former moderator and bishop of Andhra Evangelical Lutheran Church, and so many things, by the way. Just let me tell you, maybe bishop is stranger to many of our students, but many of our faculty, we know him. So I had the privilege of seeing him somewhere 2000, right? Those days there were so many giants like our bishop right here. One is silky bald head, only hair is flying, little hair flying here and there. Very dangerous look. Other one very calm and quiet. And so many like Rajaratnam, Victor Premchagam. Then here, another one. Typical, when I saw him first one, of course, his hair was gray already that time also, but sometimes mixed one. So I used to see these people when I see in the auditorium, my goodness, what kind of look these giant people are, not so dangerous. All look dangerous, right? In good sense, okay. Typical people. So I was also joking some uh, point of time, how they look and particularly our bishop here, no? Here, gray here, nice mostas. Here, beard, no? All gray, sometimes mixer. Then it looks so nice sometimes, but sometimes it looks so scary also. <laughs> but it was pleasure to know all those stalwarts of Gurukul Lutheran Theological College Research and Institute. Then one among all those leaders, along with Rajaratnam and others, I admired was our Bishop Sunilvan. Then when I joined here, he was the chairperson of GCC, and it was a pleasure to work together. I called him very short notice, rather, one week back, because we were inviting some other 
people, particularly Professor Sonazaria, Vice Chancellor of that university in Dumka, but due to certain unavoidable issues that she has encountered in university, she declined that she cannot come. So I had to catch Bishop immediately. So I called him up. Then I had a view. That's what he made deal with me last time. So last time he had nice excuse. He was in US. So he said next time. So I was taking that opportunity and then just I got hold of him over phone call. And then he willingly, very graciously accepted. Yes, I can come. So thank you so much, uh, Bishop, for your acceptance. And then here in this very, very special day on behalf of Gurukul community, faculty, students, and all other participants of this endowment lecture, we heartily welcome you, Bishop. May I request you to come up, please, Bishop. I request Rebecca Azaria, please come up and honor our bishop with power. So thank you, Bishop, and uh, thank you, Rebecca Azaraya, and the organizers for arranging this one. So let's spend time until one o'clock sharing together our joy and a lot of information on Professor uh, Nirmal Mins, also to listen to our speaker, Bishop Bano. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the program. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your kind words of welcome and also welcoming our chief guest today. Now we will have a welcome song from our Gurukul students.
thank you friends for the welcome song and now, and now let's all rise up and sing the congregational song start the lecture let's refresh our memory by getting more about bishop nirmal mens nirmal mens was the bishop emeritus of the protestant north western gosner evangelical lutheran church society who served as the bishop from 1980 through 1996 he was called as the dravidian bishop bishop mens was one of the early tribal theologians in india In 1960s he worked closely with Dr M M Thomas and they produced together Tribal Awakening considered one of the early books of tribal theology in India as a scholar Nirmal Mins was an authority of tribal and indigenous peoples and culture 
He was also the founder of the Gosner College, one of the largest colleges in Ranchi. As a young man of only 13, Nirmal Mintz faced a serious crisis in his life as his dear sister passes away. In his still-forming faith, Mintz looked to the Bible and he felt assured that he had found his answer and also heard the call for him to take up the cross and follow. Jesus became the Lord of his life and Jesus' body, the church, became the chosen field for the young Christian service and loyalty. Even as a college student, he demonstrated his commitment to Jesus by taking up leadership in a youth organization of the church and even more important in initiating a new movement of revival among young people leaving behind the opportunity of a government job that would have been available to him because of his academic excellence. He went to a seminary in Kolkata to pursue the BD studies. Mintz went to Minnesota where he pursued a dual degree program, one in theology, the other one in anthropology at Luther Seminary at the University of Minnesota representatively earning both Master of Theology, specializing in systematic theology, and a Master of Arts degree in anthropology. Mintz pursued doctoral studies at the University of Chicago, where he gained doctorate degree in systematic theology in 1986. He has written about six books and numerous articles, such as A Christian Community in Culture, the Messiah or the Prophet in Nativistic Movements, The Industrial Parish, Magatma Gandhi and Hindu-Christian Dialogue, Rise Up My People and Claim the Promise, The Gospel Among Tribals of India, Approach to Tribal Communities Today, Transforming Effects of Christianity on the tribal, Tribals of Chota Nagpur, a theological interpretation of the tribal reality in India. These are the remarkable work of Bishop Mintz. Though he was trained in the USA, Mintz's theological reflection was always rooted in the local church and to the local soil. As a leader of the church in North India, Bishop Nirmal Mintz had dedicated his life to the struggle for the truth and justice especially for the indigenous people of his region. For him, the dynamic power of the gospel of Jesus Christ has led to a new vision for society. According to Mintz, the church is grounded on the truth of Jesus Christ and hence its structures must be just. Otherwise, the church loses its credibility for insiders and outsiders alike. His tireless efforts for genuine emancipation led Bishop Mintz to participate in social, religious, political, and cultural aspect of tribal community life. Mintz views tribes as being an indigenous people of India and opines that moves to alienate their land holding will cause destruction to the planet Earth itself. To contextualize the Christian faith into the local culture, Mintz, as a principal of theological college, encouraged the use of the mando, a tribal drum, made from skin and clay. The tribal drum had previously been banned in church, not by written laws, through the long practice. As a theologian and a reformer, he could not continue this tradition the seminary became the first place to use tribal drum and dance in a major religious function, thus facilitating the contextualization of the Christian faith in this indigenous tribal world of Chota Nagpur. The most read controversy, however, about the property of tribal drumming in church, for the first time, people were forced to evaluate what they were taught about their own heritage and to consider accepting the tribal drum as an enriching gift to the life of the church. Min's concern was not limited to theological education alone, but included broader needs and challenges of the society. 
He opened a liberal arts college. It gave preference to the applicants with a third division. Those who got lower marks were given priority to get the admission, whereas the normal custom used to those who scored the higher marks used to get the admission in several colleges, but he opened the way the lower mark people, lower scoring mark people to enter into this college. Under Min's leadership, the college acquired a high and respected place as one of the prime colleges of the region. Bishop Mins is credited with having introduced the teaching of tribal and local languages at the college. Such local languages, which had been shocked out of this time by the dominant languages, suddenly found a new lease on a life. A direct outcome of this linguistic initiative was the introduction of tribal and local languages also at Ranchi University. In 1960, as a newly wedded couple, the bishop and his wife were living in a large bungalow of six rooms at the Lutheran Church campus in Ranchi. Ranchi was a center of education where many girls came for higher education, but the church had no hostel for women students. The men realized that they did not need more than two rooms, so they converted four rooms of their house into a girls' hostel. This encouraged the church to open a girl hostel in a better facility at the later date. Mintz had been a committed ecumenical leader. Under his leadership, the Ranchi OMCA was established. Bishop Mintz suggested Vikas Madri, friend of development, reminds here, premier church government development society there. Mintz became the first bishop of the new church when the office of the bishop was established in 1982. One of the cardinal principles of the new church, again spelled out by Bishop Mintz, was self-reliance. And after more than 30 years, the church has become a model for many Indian churches for how an Indian church can, can not only survive, but grow in ministry on the basis of its own God-given resources. Bishop Mintz became the driving force behind many other new beginnings as well. For example, he initiated and provided leadership for a radio ministry as a theology and linguistic and a person dedicated to biblical education for the laity. Bishop Mintz led the church to translate the entire Bible into the local tribal language. Inspired by both his understanding of theology and his concern for justice, Bishop Mintz led the church to take another bold step, sending women candidates for theological training for pastoral ministries. This initiative finally led the church to pass a resolution to include female pastors in the ministry of the word and sacrament, and the first two women pastors were ordained in 2000, in the anniversary year. By then, Bishop Mintz had retired from his ministry, yet the seed that he has sown now bore fruit. This was the first time that the women candidates were adding, ordained for the ministry, and Bishop Mintz has been the active in the ministry of the church even after his retirement. Bishop Mintz's theological vision included the whole society with a special place for the marginalized and the victims of injustice. He distinguished himself by speaking against injustice, preparator against the tribal people of his place, writing to raise the consciousness of tribal people about injustice, and even actively participating in organizing a people's organization for resistance against injustice and exploitation. He is one of the very Christian leaders who enjoys wide acceptance as a tribal spokesperson. The struggle for truth and justice remained the overwhelming of life of Bishop Mintz as a pastor, theologian, scholar, activist, and anthropologist. In all of these roles, Bishop Mintz's effort was to facilitate a new vision, especially for the tribal society. Despite his eminence, Bishop Mintz continued to live in a small house in his village outside the ranchi. So, 
this morning we are very privileged to learn more about the eminent leadership of Bishop Mintz. And also we are very privileged to have in our midst the presenter of this uh, lecture, Bishop Emirates, Dr. Sunil Banuso, is another eminent personality who also shoulder and toil for the same mission and vision of Nirmal Mintz as a diff in a different area. I think he is the apt person to lecture on this day. Grateful to the Endowment Lecture Committee for identifying a right person to deliver the lecture on this particular day. Reverend Dr. Sunil Bonusar is the President Emirates of the Protestant Andhra Evangelical Lutheran Church Society, who served a term from 2009 through 2013. He is known for his excellence in academics. President Emirates studied at the Andhra Christian Theological College, Hyderabad. Later, he undertook postgraduate study at the Southeast Asia Graduate School of Theology, from where he was awarded the degree of MPH. He served as the pastor of the Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Vaisak, and he taught at Bishop College, Kolkata, before moving to Gurukul Lutheran Theological College here in Chennai. He taught uh, religion, interfaith relations, and Dalit theology, and also served as the dean of the Department of Research and Doctoral Studies. He shouldered and contributed in different capacities at the national and international level, such as LWF Council Advisor on the Committee for Theology and Ecumenical Reasons, served as the chairperson of Andhra Pradesh Christian Council, an auxiliary to the National Council of Churches in India, and a vice chairperson of the Church Axillary for Social Action Humanitarian Response Network. He was also the member of Academic Council of Senate of Sarampur in West Bengal. His major contribution was seen through the publication of the bibliography of original Christian writing in India in Telugu, compiled by Ravela Joseph, for which Sir provided his assistance that ultimately resulted in publication of the Board of Theological Education of the Senate of Saramford College in 1993 under the agency of general editors Hunter P. Mapri and H. S. Wilson. The compilation of by Sir together with Ravila Joseph had been a source referred for original Christian writing in Telugu. In addition, Sir has also co-translated Robin Boyd's introduction to Indian Christian theology along with uh, Victor Pramsegar and Christy Kumar, his professors at the Andhra Christian Theological College. He contributed significantly to the theological community, community by writings, particularly glimpses of test century celebration or arrival of the Batlik Meyu Siegenbach, the father of modern Protestant mission in 2019 and also wrote collective articles, being a resource person to various programs at the national and international level. So we are so privileged to have you today. The time is all yours to deliver us the lecture on the theme. Thank you, sir. We welcome you on behalf of Gurukul Lutheran Theological College. Thank you so much, Esther. In fact, I'm so thrilled to be here. It's like a homecoming. After spending almost three decades on this campus, coming back is always a joy. At the outset, I should uh, express my gratitude 
to our principal, Reverend Dr. Sangram Basmatari, for inviting me to deliver this endowment lecture on a wonderful human being, Bishop Dr. Nirmal Minch. He has been after me for on several occasions and all the time I have found uh, good excuses to say no. This time when he called me a couple of weeks back and told me, invited me, unconsciously I said yes. Then after going back to my diary, I found that uh, I was already engaged in some other uh, program and uh, I felt guilty for saying yes. But now I rejoice looking at all of you to be here. And it's a God given blessing. And thank you, Dr. Songram Basmatari, for all those good words that you spoke about me. A person was dead and the body was kept in the coffin and the funeral service was going on and people were talking so high about the dead person then the widow called her son and said go and check whether the body is your father's or not because people are talking so high about him it's like me today I was wondering whether I was kind of that person which all of you are talking about me or not. Anyway, thank you. I enjoyed those wonderful words. Thank you, Prasuna, the convener of the endowment lectures, for remembering me and suggesting my name to the principal. Thank you so much. And the respected faculty members, dear students, and ladies and gentlemen. I was wondering whether I'm really qualified to deliver this lecture on this wonderful popular leader of one of our church, Bishop Dr. Minch a noble soul. Then I was looking back into the qualifications, whether I am suited or not. The first qualification, though very flimsy, is that I have taught a course in this college for several years, Primal Religions. And the primal religions is a word that was coined by Bishop Minch, which were before known as the primitive religions. I was so grateful to his vision for calling the native religions as primal religions. Then the second qualification, I believe, is that I come from a Dalit community. As you might have learned, Dalit community is an oppressed community, a discriminated against community. So is the Adivasi or tribal peoples. So that is my second qualification to deliver this lecture. And the third is the very passionate, strong invitation from my good friend, your principal, Dr. Sangram Basavatari. Not to miss this opportunity. Yes, it is an honor. It's an honor to deliver this lecture. I'm grateful to all of you. Before delivering the actual lecture, 
let me humbly confess that gurukul is an academia and therefore the lecture that you have received doesn't stand for this scientific scrutiny it's not a scientific paper it's a paper that reflects my random thoughts so forgive me for that indulgence secondly my very being is entwined with gurukul with the academic activities of gurukul about which we feel proud and honor of its bold vision when pe people talk about gurukul people mention its bold vision the bold vision of identifying oneself with the downtrodden with the oppressor and the theologies dalit theology feminist theology eco theology have emerged from this great institution of course tribal theology was in the mind of gurukul but then the northeast scholars have already come up with several resources of doing tribal theology therefore the bold vision of gurukul encourages me to come and stand before you this morning i was a teacher for quite long time you know joycey thank you but uh, let me correct you as my student emirates is airlines people will uh, think that i own that aim airlines no emeritus is the word a retired person who still holds that title as an honor allowed to hold that title emeritus bishop emeritus simply call me sunil ban that would be great thank you so much and also the principal was telling me that uh, bishop minj has earned his phd already in 1966 60 <coughs> 68 so because that will become part of a record please correct that uh, date as well don't get offended you are my student with that freedom thank you so much when you are bored i will cough very softly or hold your hands so that i can stop in 1994 religion and society the journal of the caesars has published an article of bishop dr minch written in honor of professor saral k chatterji the then director of caesars at the end of the article an introduction was given about bishop minch the introduction says that bishop minch was a leading adivasi theologian writer educationist anthropologist and cultural and political activist all these things joycey has already mentioned added to this he was also an episcopal leader and administrator in other words bishop minch was enveloped 
in multiple identities through which we the people try to understand his persona and his view and way of life except the first identity adivasi all the other identities for me are add ons therefore bishop means core identity is adivasi as all of all of us are aware identity is an integral part of every human being and it is necessary for his or her existence in the society however understanding and acknowledging the identity of a person is a complex process and being dependent on varied and diverse factors it's a lifelong search and struggle it's a search and struggle for example every sphere of life in our contemporary society we see the process of globalization which is influencing individuals making him or her identity as very fluid diverse multiple and changeable for example one can change his or her identity through immigration identity of nationality through immigration and become a citizen of some other country one can also change his or her identity of gender from male to female or the vice versa or even to transgender and changing of religious and political identities are also very common and possible today we see this phenomenon of multiple identities in our lives because of this these unending possibilities that either forces or encourages to develop alternate identity or identities i acknowledge that these multiple identity is also creating confusion and crisis in one's own understanding of identity both internally and externally in fact identity becomes authentic and genuine only if it is rooted in the core of the individual as well as of the community in the core of the world view of both the individual and of the community to which he or she belongs or a community into which one belongs to identity offers belongingness let me emphasize that identity offers belongingness however in fact which we have to notice is that globalization is breaking down all the barriers of national cultural social economic and political identities 
and thereby paving a way to the danger of homogeneity of diverse ethnic communities depriving them of their unique identity and its handmade modernity is creating an identity crisis both in the individual as well as in her or his community with reference to this identity crisis vis a vis adivasis versus modernity vati longcha bemoans i quote modernity in spite of its positive contributions in many areas of life has created restlessness and identity crisis among the tribes modernity has created restlessness and identity crisis among the tribes along with modernity one of the other factors that is creating identity crisis crisis is caused by imposed identity rather than a chosen identity the adivasis are identified as we are all aware of with several epithets such as vijati different people vanavasi forest dwellers girijan or pahadi mountain dwellers or hill people janajati tribals and adivas the first are original dwellers or the first citizens of this country along with sanskrit or hindi terminology some other english phrases were also used to identify the adivasis for example the british colonial governments census commissioner in 1891 based on the habitat of the adivasis described them as forest tribes which we have already seen in the sanskrit terminology in 1901 they were notified as animists and in 1911 one finds them mentioned as tribal animists in the consequent census reports and particularly in 1931 while they were mentioned as primitive tribes and backward tribes they were mentioned in 1941 report describes them as simply as tribes however only in 1940 a census report they were mentioned as adivasis the government of india in 1950 in order to offer special provisions or affirmative action for the welfare of adivasis they were recognized as scheduled tribes these identities were not of the choice of the adivasis or the tribals but were imposed by the outsiders according to the 2001 census the adivasis in india or the tribals in india are enumerated to be about 8.14% of the total population of india and their population stands at 84.51 million so this is 2001 census but then the now 2021 census the figure might have changed the constitution of india in its article 342 outlines the criteria to identify the adivasis as tribal based on their living in geographical isolation on their economic backwardness due to primitive methods of agriculture low value of closed economy distinctive culture language and religion as well as 
their shyness to contact the outsiders. However, in painting the general characteristics of Adivasis or the tribals, the description of the Commission for Scheduled Castes and Scheduled Tribes in 1952 has taken deep roots in the minds of the non Adivasi tribal population and which was very appalling and pejorative. The commissioner in his report says, I quote, Tribals are people who live in the forests and jungles away from the civilized world. They belong to Negrito, Astroloid or Mongoloid stocks. They speak the same tribal language or dialect and they profess primitive religion known as animism. They follow primitive occupations like hunting, gathering, etc. They are largely carnivorous, that is flesh and meat eaters. They live either naked or semi-naked using tree barks or leaves. They love drinks and dance and spend their life with nomadic habits. End of the quote. The depiction of the commissioner reflects the general Indian non adivasi non-tribal perception of these people as subhumans or primitives or uncivilized or backward who are in need of civilization, being civilized and brought into the mainstream of our nation. There is no doubt that any community will feel hurt and traumatized when slapped with a negative identity by the outside others and the same applies to the Adivasis tribals as well. One should not fail to see the reality of these primal communities carrying an impeccable positive and authentic identity as Adivasis or tribals through their cohesive community fellowship or kinship, language or dialect, conscious knowledge and understanding of their shared history, equality of all, and rich cultural traditions which are expressed in nature, human being, spirit, continue. There are about 500 plus Adivasi tribal communities in India such as the Santals, Oravans, Kukis, Nagas, and so on and so forth. Here at this juncture, one should note that Adivasi is an umbrella term for these heterogeneous communities of people who claim as the aboriginal or the original people of India. In fact, the term Adivasi is derived from Sanskrit language and denotes the meaning as original. Please underline that original inhabitants of our country. Some of the anthropological studies reveal that the term Adivasi is coined in 1930s in the context of struggle of these people against the intrusion not only of the colonial government but also of the outsiders settlers from outside and deceitful money lenders. In fact, this term comes into existence in the context of the experience of the loss of access to forest produce, alienation from ancestral lands 
and forceful eviction and that is displacement of people from their habitat in the name of development. However, while many communities of Adivasi prefer this term as relevant to their identity, some communities from the Northeast favor to calling themselves as tribal peoples. The term Adivasi or tribal, which was once looked down, has now become a symbol of identity, assertion. Therefore, I will alternatively use both these terms or at the same time use the terms. Here at this point, it would be helpful to look at one of the debates of Jaipal Singh Munda, an Adivasi member, and B. R. Ambedkar on the floor of the Constituent Assembly in 1946 about the terminology. Munda was a writer, a politician, and a sports person from the Adivasi community from Jharkhand. In fact, he led our Indian hockey team in the 1928 Summer Olympics held at Amsterdam and won the gold for India. That is the personality of Munda. While Jaspal Singh Munda was in favor of and preferred the term Adivasi, instead of using scheduled tribe for his people, the chairman of the drafting committee, Baba Saheb Ambedkar, opined the term Adivasi is a general term and has no legal validity. Therefore, Ambedkar insisted that in view of the need for a precise definition, the term scheduled tribe stands the test of the law and hence the government of India prefer, preferred to call Adivasis as scheduled tribes. For a person, Identity crisis emerges when the forced identity fails to reflect or bring out the core kernel of a person and when his or her roots are ignored. This invariably results in the loss of belongingness. Therefore, affirming one's own identity, authentic or genuine self-identity is essential to exist in the society with pride and honor. This we see in the aspiration for affirming the identity among the Adivasis or the tribals. It is an undeniable fact that the Adivasis or tribals live in geographical isolation, living in remote and inhospitable areas such as valleys, plains, hills and forests. Their economy is considered by the others, the so-called civilized, as backward because of their subsistence on hunting and gathering and practice of agriculture using primitive technological methods, which result in low level of income. Further, they have insignificant levels of literacy and they depend on priests and medicine men for healing from all evils, including ill health. However, in the self-understanding of the Adivasi tribal communities, one sees the absence of caste, which denotes ritual purity and pollution. Non-existence of class and hierarchy that is the gradation of people from higher to lower social categories. 
rich in egalitarianism where everyone is considered equal to the other irrespective of gender or other differences community based economy expressed in the symbiosis of jal jungle jameen the world view visualized as nature human being spirit continuum and fine arts that depict the view and way of life of these people one of the other reasons for identity crisis is the alienation of land during the period of british colonialism an alienation of land began with the forest act of 1864 and finally the fate of the adivasis or the tribals was sealed with the indian forest act of 1927 which reduced the land rights of the people and transformed them into a mere privileges conferred by the government in fact the concept jal jungle jameen water forest and land is very much intrinsic to the very being of adivasis or tribals and this triad affirms a unique identity to them for them land is everything and that is the crops they plant and grow and they believe that the forest and its produce as inseparable essential and integral part of their very life and identity rather than considering them as resources of subsistence however with the advent of the british colonial government and its policies which has created an identity crisis continues even today under the successive governments of india as a consequence of land alienation the adivasis or tribals continue to live with identity crisis due to rampant land alienation in this context bishop nirmal minj vividly articulates this organic relationship when he declares now i quote now we have accepted the organic view of the earth and the nature that there is a living organic relationship between human beings trees animals insects water air sunshine and soil of this earth the adivasis have been holding these views from time immemorial and they have understood human beings as an integral part of this macro organism it is precisely this value of the tribals that is pro life and pro humanity the identity as adivasis or tribal and their view of jal jungle jameen is pro life and pro humanity in other words the identity of the adivasi or tribals is firmly rooted in their inseparable relationship with the nature and land denial and deprival of this relationship through negative outlook and land alienation robbed the adivasi tribals of their authentic and genuine identity therefore as one of the possible ways of restoring a positive identity the adivasis and tribals consider protest movements for self assertion that offer an affirmed identity as mentioned earlier the colonial government was instrumental in ushering the breakdown of social cultural economic and religious structures of the adivasis and tribals in their history there were about 70 resistance movements and some of these are the coal insurrection the bumji revolt the santal rebellion the karwar movement the birsa movement the narmada bachao andolan the adivasi gotra mahasabha and many others through these resistance movements the adivasi and our tribal sport for the restoration of their rights of forest lands and declared their <coughs> lands declared their lands as resources 
given by God to them. Land is a resource given by God to them. For the Adivasis are tribals, land is intertwined with their very lives. To illustrate this, Vinita Damodaran paraphrases the response and outlook of an Adivasi tribal when asked by the government officials for the title deeds of their lands in the following passage. I quote, when asked, where are your title deeds? The answer is, my spade, my axe, my plowshare are my title deeds. Plowing is the writing of the golden pen on golden land. To the argument, your lands have been auctioned for areas of rent and purchased by another. They replied, when a man buys a mat, he rolls it up and takes it away. Similarly, unless the purchaser has rolled up my land and taken it away, how can he be said to have purchased them? This conversation brings to the fore the Adivasi or tribal worldview. Like any other person, they also have their unique beyond way of life that reflects the values and ethos. The worldview sustains a strong sense of equality and justice. Their understanding of the origin of cosmos and human beings that offers equal opportunities for individual freedom and community cohesion. Their awareness of the present life and the life after death, which emphasizes the need for honesty and sincerity. And their knowledge of the Supreme Being and the other beings that exist and guide them to the practicality of for today and a hope for tomorrow. These are told and retold in their myths and legends. Their worldview, in fact, highlights the holistic view of God's creation and can be summed up in nature, human beings, spirit continuum. Such a harmony with God and nature and the awareness of being one with the whole of God's creation is the roots root of their identity and their longing for authentic and genuine identity as human beings without any negative and pejorative connotations. Since identity is rooted in one's own worldview, one sees an awakening for restoration and affirmation of such an affirmed identity among the Adivasis of tribals and the Adivasi tribe theology makes an effort towards this awakening of the Adivasi tribal psyche. Someone had opined that if the indigenous cultures and here in this case, the worldview of Adivasi or tribals fail to discover their own identity, then they will not have any future. If they fail to discover their own authentic and genuine identity, they will not have any future. In this connection, Bishop Minj says, the tribal people's history is rooted in the land where their ancestors also had lived. Land is the key to their identity as people, no land, no people is the tribal sense of the term. No land, no people. In other words, there is a clarion call for awakening, a theological awakening for that matter. Theology simply said is nothing but God talk in relation to human beings and the nature. For centuries we have inherited Western categories of theology that emphasizes God as the absolute and transcendent and human being as the creature who is a sinner and in need of salvation. The Indian Christian theology emphasizes the Vedic philosophical understanding articulating the need to realize one as a Brahman. 
as theological fraternity we have noticed that these kinds of theologies are otherworldly and insensitive to the contextual realities most of the time the theologies which we the indian christians have inherited is either from the western categories or from the philosophical hindu categories even with the incarnation of christ jesus as human being offering liberation to the people the dominant concept of sin and salvation continues unabated and has triggered the emergence of contextual theologies like dalit theology feminist theology adivasi or tribal theologies as alternative or counter theologies to deal with contextual realities vis-a-vis -vis the hope and aspirations of the discriminated against and oppressed people for liberation as a departure point for theological articulation of contextual realities the adivasi tribal people conscious of their shared history consider themselves as the defeated ones because their history is a history of defeat suffering and oppression they suffered subjugation at the hands of the aryan invaders the muslim rulers and under the british administration independent british administration independent india today the tribals continue to suffer humiliation at the hands of the privileged rich elites in many ways the tribals have also become victims of modernization today the tribals are people who are culturally alienated and uprooted socially oppressed and dehumanized economically exploited and dominated politically powerless and divided and theologically unheard and voiceless end of the quote in such a context of helplessness and powerlessness the aim and mission of theology is to uphold and affirm their identity through theological articulation of liberation of here and now take into consideration the world view of the defeated oppressed and suffering people in other words cs song secondly puts it i quote theology has a has to wrestle with the earth and not with the heaven in other words jal jangal zameen and nature human being spirit the two pillars or foundations of the world view of the adivasis or tribals are the basis of a praxeological theology of liberation it is true that through though there are is a plurality of and flexibility of identity however the core essence and values of a person remains stable and firm if it is rooted in his or her ethnicity and the inseparable belongingness to his or ethnic community in other words a genuine and authentic identity of a person is based on ecologically harmonious wholesome relationships relations with the nature with the creator and with the members of his or her own community and of course with the others as well and that is to say identity is a quest for human dignity and self respect in the christian parlance identity is a is a belief that human beings are created in the image of god and therefore every person is equal to the other in terms of self respect and freedom as we are aware the adivasi tribals are inundated with devastating and life threatening issues like globalization modernization land alienation and many other making them to suffer untold misery and loss of identity in order to overcome the identity crisis and to march towards self assertion for the restoration and reclaiming of their lost or robbed or deprived or denied identity venturing into a contextual and praxeological theological articulation based on their life giving world view for me is nothing but the beginning of the awakening 
of the Adivasis or tribals in their journey towards regaining a genuine and authentic self-identity. One of the pioneering architects of such a powerful and creative theology is Bishop Dr. Nirmal Min, and his le legacy lives forever. And Bishop Nirmal Min's theology can be summed up in his clarion call, Garose Kaho Hamadivasi Hai. Let us say with pride, we are Adivasi sub tribals. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you, sir, for enlightening with us your lecture today on the theme, Identity Crisis and Adivasi Awakening, particularly highlighting identity as a quest for human dignity and self-respect. Having the image of God, every person is equal to the other in terms of self-respect and freedom. I hope our friends here benefited with the insight that you have brought us today. Thank you, sir. Now we are breaking for tea, 15 minutes of tea break time. Uh, once we come after the tea break, we will continue our session. Reverend Dr. Jacob Sundar Singh sir is ready with his response. And I also request you to formulate questions if you have any, as you have a identity dialogue during the tea break. Thank you all, see you after tea break. And also, it's a kind request to the online participants to kindly wait for 15 minutes. And we will be starting up the session soon after the tea break. Thank you all.
crisis. I was able to hear many of the dialogues which was happened there, uh, which is the reflection of the lecture that was given by our special guest today. Uh, thank you online participants for your uh, patience. And we are beginning our second session. Now we'll have a special number which was composed by Bishop Nirmal Mins. Our dear friends from Gurukul will give us a special number. The song which we are going to sing was written and composed by right Reverend Dr. Nirman Minch. Uh, it's a song prayer he used to sing every morning before he start his days.
you friends for rendering the wonderful and meaningful special number which was composed by the Bishop M. Nirmal Mins. And now I request Reverend Dr. Jacob Sundar Singh, sir, um, professor in the Department of Christian Ministry of Gurukul Lutheran Theological College to kindly share the response for the lecture delivered by right, right Reverend Dr. Busey Sunil Bonner, sir. Good afternoon, dear friends. First of all, I thank God for this opportunity given to me to be part of this academic exercise. Let me also thank the principal of our college and the organizers of Bishop Dr. Nirmal Min's endowment lecture for having given me this privileged assignment to respond to our beloved and esteemed friend, colleague, leader, theologian, Bishop Sunil Bonner. I deem it as a great privilege, beloved Annan. Let me also congratulate and thank all the preparations done for this academic exercise. It's befitting to remember such great stalwarts who have laid the foundation for new theological, counter-theological thinking. Always we were trained to study somebody written theology from the West or from US to mug up and to just reflect them without using our contextual experiences. It's a great privilege to be part of Gurukul as a student and also as one of the faculty members to see how God has enabled through this institution many people to get transformed in their theological thinking <coughs> and in their ministerial and academic pursuits. It is always good to remember the forefathers and mothers who have laid foundation for such new theological thinking. Though it is the last lecture for this academic year, it is our desire that it should continue every year with much more vigor and meaningful interactions. Thank you for the wonderful singing, two songs by our friends, recapturing our ethos as well as our culture through wonderful musical instruments and singing. As it is mentioned by the moderator, the drum was not part of Christian culture, Christian worship. It was forbidden. It was said it is of other people, not Christian people. Thank you for bringing that instrument all the way from your place and using it in our services. Identity crisis <coughs> and the Adivasi awakening is one of the <coughs> significant titles with which we had a very good interaction and deliverance by our guest speaker today, rather special speaker. When Gurukul became the testing lab and the pioneer and premier institution of new theologies, especially with Dalit theology, <coughs> with uh, feminist theology in 1980s, various issues such as <coughs> human rights, social justice, conversion, <coughs> the values of kingdom of God, women emancipation, legal rights, 
assertion of privileges fighting against unjust practices and structures and reclaiming the identity have become some of the major areas i am glad today speaker has talked much about the identity of adivasis you might have heard recently in one of the speeches of the prime minister of india he was constantly and consciously using the word vanwasi than adivasi it was a deliberate attempt to name them with some other name with a new name with a new understanding with the new connotation denying their historical heritage their lineage their attachment to the land their contribution to the land through the land to the entire nation the rich cultural religious heritage negating all of them just calling them as vanwasi may not be accepted by the major section of the people our beloved speaker has very wonderfully given the old census in which he has very well explained this adivasis may be divided into different groups with various ethnic identities lingual and their ethical practices but adivasi is a umbrella term which make almost 8.14 percentage of the total indian population of our country or 84.51 million people of this nation has adivasis can we simply brush aside brush aside and say you are after all adivasi without any um, promotion you have no use we will treat you in a very lower status we will take away forcibly your identity can that be done they are not uh, ordinary people groups they form a significant number of percentage of people groups therefore this issue of reclaiming identity or asserting identity of adivasis have become a vital question today so also when indian christian theology was formed they have started with a very important pertinent question which our presenter has very vividly explained one of the pioneer adivasi theologians dr a patti langcha in his book the need for doing tribal theology i think every one of us should read it and understand the essence of that particular article or book the need for doing tribal theology he has explained how can we describe the adivasis he says from his perspective from his understanding i read from page 7 their history is a history of defeat suffering and oppression they suffered subjugation at the hands of the aryan invaders secondly the muslim rulers and thirdly under the british administration in independent india today the tribals continue to suffer humiliation at the hands of the privileged rich elites in other words from time immemorial constantly they are subjugated that's the starting point of this paper that's the heart of this paper in which dr sudil banu is very vividly saying i am interested and everyone should be interested in reclaiming the identity mainly because of the condition of the people from time immemorial till today they are subjugated 
they are defeated tribals continue to suffer humiliation at the hands of privileged elites in many ways the tribals have also become victims of modernization today the tribals are people who are culturally alienated and uprooted socially oppressed and dehumanized economically exploited and dominated politically powerless and divided and theologically unheard and voiceless what a stray, strong statement it is this is the condition of the tribals adivasis of today even in modern india after globalization after modernization and so many other factors which are giving us dual identities or false identities or pseudo identities as christian church what should we do simply understand that problem and brush aside saying okay they are suffering they are poor they are politically powerless they are uprooted they are cheated shall we just go away only with understanding i request every one of us to have a dialogue to have a discussion this is the reality and we have a very good theological outlook and theological framework how to mingle it how to use it how to make this people come to their original status that is the challenge today by this paper for which dr mins has committed his life our moderator has very beautifully said even at the young age he had the opportunity of getting a very good governmental job but dr mins preferred to be in the church struggle with the people as a church person as an administrator as a theologian as a committed christian as young people emerging from this college going out to different places it is a challenge not to abandon the church not to criticize the church not to say church is useless without any usefulness it is our duty we are going to form the church dr not nirmal means did not have a very smooth sailing during his lifetime as our presenter today said after a person is dead somebody will be talking very good about us but we should be truthful to the gospel because it is the act of jesus christ which made people to reclaim their identities jesus identified himself with everyone therefore with few questions i would like to open the session for discussion whether adivasis should reclaim their identities at all or not whether it is necessary or not necessary there are two views some people may say yes 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 they should reclaim their identities some mothers will say no 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 they will climb up in their economic status they will become even president of india then why should we worry about our adivasi identity let us have some other forced identity or inherited identity as administrator first citizen of india like that this is a very pertinent question wherever we go up whatever may be our financial status political status or economic status what should be our privilege or our priority whether to reclaim our identity or not that's the first question then if yes why if no why then how that exercise of reclaiming our identities our privileged position would benefit the adivasis not others i may talk about adivasi and become a very great adivasi theology i may talk about dalit and i may become a very wonderful dalit historian i will be benefited but what way that people groups will be benefited that should be our aim that's the second one whether to have 
a collective umbrella identity our presenter has beautifully explained it is a collective umbrella identity as adivasi but there are so many people from different uh, ethnic groups he has named them whether to have one collective identity or to claim each and every clan's identity that means it's a very great task every single group should be concentrated in a very minute manner that's another thing then to claim their identity whether they should always remain as christian or sometimes we should give up our christian identity in what way being a christian adivasi is a helpful one or a harmful one to do this theological exercise can we manage with these two identities being as a christian as well as as adivasi or we should just take away our identity as a christian it's a very big question that crisis is there in dalit theologians and those who are working in inside the church for dalit liberation they will say when you become a christian you should not call you as a dalit you are a christian that's all general christian you cannot become a dalit christian but after 1980s after gurukul's bold vision now we have boldly say i am a dalit christian because we want to retain both the identities for doing theology and for liberation then after climbing up in social ladder becoming as a economically affluent person from adivasi community what should be our activities there being there as a great person or a high positioned person whether we still we should still work for the emancipation of other people or how should we exercise our things thank you sir for creating much interest and for making us to think with so many questions time is very limited actually but your paper has kindled in us the thought to make us meaningful servants of god's gospel because once we accept jesus as our savior accepting the gospel we will always fight for justice we will always sideline with the oppressed we will always be spokespersons of the underprivileged thank you for enlightening us it's not only bishop nirmal means like many others you have also committed your life for the cause of those underprivileged i am grateful again to principal the organizing committee and the moderator for making this event a meaningful one thank you yeah so i would like to bring in family members dr nira uh, nijhar one of the daughters is waiting from us to speak it's getting late for her they have another program for their time 3 am because in the name of dr min's wife that is paracleta means they are starting a play school in ranchi since it is bad day they are organizing here 3 pm there 3 am so now dr nijar are you online now yes i am okay okay so we welcome you to speak now and thank you for your patience and waiting until midnight so we would like to invite you to speak on behalf of the family dr nijar time is for you thank you so much and uh, thank you um principal dr Bas basu matari and thank you reverend uh, right reverend dr sunil banu and uh, also sir um when you responded i'm sorry i missed uh, your name so please excuse me uh, but thank you so much for um the organizing first of all this uh, endowment uh, lecture and uh, um or um arranging all the things 
sorry, my older sister Sona could not be here. Um, she, uh, as uh, Dr. Basumartari shared that uh, you, first you have contacted her, but uh, due to her um, busy schedule as well as other events um, and responsibilities as a vice chancellor, she was she's not able to be here. Uh, but in the future, I'm sure she will be available and uh, uh, there will be opportunity for others also to contribute uh, to this endowment lecture. Thank you so much, uh, Banu sir, for um, bringing the many thoughts and, uh, uh, and the response was also great. Thank you for all those questions. I wanted to say one simple thing, saying that I am an Uran Christian. This is what I grew up with. And my parents always, when we were very little, they talked about it. They said, you know who you are. First of all, you are a child of God. You're the daughter of the Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And number two is you are our children, meaning daughters of Nirmal and Parakleta, who are around. And so we grew up with that understanding and that is embedded in our blood that we are around Christians and we are proud to be around Christians. And we thank God for the um, for giving us um, birth in the family that uh, the Lord had planned and the Lord um, uh, opened so many possibilities and, and helped us to see what, what it means to be an around Christian. So I want to thank um, God for that and the opportunity to share. There are so many things I wanted to, to say, but uh, my notes are here and there. Um, you know, one thing people always talk about Adivasi, and it is a term that um, even Banu sir uh, shared about it. And it, it, and the question also is, is it good to have collective identity? It's not easy uh, that way, you know, when you think about it, I want to bring my, my um, uniqueness in that. And I want people to know that uniqueness. But when you bring everybody together um, and collective identity talk about it, you really don't have much to share and contribute. So, but this is my own personal um, opinion, and uh, I would, as you as you'll have opportunity to discuss, you can discuss about many other things. Um, yeah, I wanted to say in, in that same regard, uh, my people never call themselves Adivasi. They always introduce, even today, if you go to our area in the village where Uram people, Kuruk people live, they'll say, I am a Kuruk. They will never say, I am an Adivasi. So that is the identity. And with identity comes the language. And uh, as, as um, people are calling us Adivasi, you know, my father always said, we are indigenous people. And uh, that is um, the part of bringing us together, but still giving us space for our own identity to really, um, we can share those identities. So with that, I think I will let you discuss and uh, thank you so much for, uh, for the time and uh, uh, opportunity for us to be part of. Um, it, it is, um, I, as I was looking at all those five um, lectures that you had, four of them were so connected with uh, Gurukul and they were teaching there or they were directors there. My father was not a teacher there, but God used him to bring something, uh, to bring the uniqueness in the area of theology, especially tribal theology. Uh, not only for India, but for the world. So we are grateful to God for that privilege. 
and the gift that uh, God gave to us uh, for uh, him as a pair, as a dad, as a father, but to the world. And so we always said that he's not only our father, he's father to all, those who want to claim him father. So thank you so much. Uh, having this endowment lecture on this special day. Thank you all for your contribution. And I once again thank uh, Reverend Dr. Jacob Sundar Singh, sir, uh, for, for the wonderful and detailed response. And also, thank you for contributing your valuable thoughts by reflecting on the topic that we are discussing today. And uh, friends, yeah? do you like to respond now or along with students? Okay, thank you, sir. And now it's the time for discussion. If you have any questions, kindly raise it. Uh, kindly tell your name first, then you can follow with your question. It's open for all the students and faculty members and community members. My my beloved Bishop, I became a fond of Dalit theology because of you in the beginning. Still remember your classes on Dalit theology. Really appreciate this presentation. I am well fascinated because the paper is well focused on the theme, well structured and well written. Each and every sentence is informative. Thank you so very much. The theme is very significant. As you have mentioned in your paper, Modernity was on identity construction. Identity construction on both the self and the other. But in this era, the era of post-colonialism and post-modernism, we are purposefully away from identity construction. One of the strong notions of postmodernism is against identity construction. Postmodernism demands that identity construction is a wrong process. But we all like the identity of Adivasi because we acknowledge that. The identity of Adivasi is fluid in nature. At the same time, with the plurality and also with flexibility, it has been mentioned in the paper. My simple issue on this. If any identity is being with the fluidity, plurality, and flexibility, how can that identity be in crisis? Please serve me. Thank you. Any other questions? Bishop, thank you so much uh, for your paper. I am Vinolin Kaleb, MTH student. Uh, when you were talking about uh, identity, you were touching so many things. 
self identity or imposed identity or fusion identity or forcing forced identity like many identities you touch maybe all these concepts are okay but when it comes to practicality being a human itself is a problem now uh, simply said uh, already i told to anand sundar singh anand so simply said having hair itself is a problem if i have a long hair people will call me with that identity if i don't have any hair they will call me bald head without hair they will say bald head that is also the problem of identity and another thing uh, now looking at me you may say you have a salt and pepper style that is also another problem you are also having i am also having white hair but people will call gray hair so whatever we have or uh, this identities it is all our problematic one that is a, a problem already boa sachin also told it's a invention of modernity and it was against by post modernity so what i feel whatever we propose identity as identity that is in crisis because it is given by others or other factors whatever identity i got maybe my name by my parents my land my language and other factors are giving the identity and sometimes identity identities are decided by the context or the situation or the principle what i am following uh, like christians that identity was given by others and at the same time naxalites terrorists uh, these kind of identities uh, was what they have chosen the path the uh, the principle and another identity nowadays me too this is the identity of pain of sexual violence so all these identities where it leads the final thing jesus so we know jesus jesus himself asked who do you say I, what i am so no one called him with the particular identity jesus everyone called him as jesus christ and then some people more and more they went lord son of god the titles they were given by others the titles to jesus even jesus christ facing these kind of identity crises how come we can left from this and another thing jesus was considered as dangerous for the religious and roman authorities why because he struggles and whatever he has taken his preachings it is all for the benefit of all whole humanity that's why he was considered as dangerous the same thing we can take into the tribals also now tribals also are dangerous they are naxalites they are terrorists whatever uh, they want to give the authorities are giving why they are giving to uh, tribals like this because they are struggling for the benefit of many so i can conclude this like finally the roman empire constantine <coughs> accept the identity of jesus christ then only he can withhold his power as a roman empire so which mean uh, it is not because of identity crisis it is all because of our praxology uh, our practice or our solidarity our practicality so uh, identity crisis when we are talking about identity crisis it is a crisis of that identity itself the word the concept itself so we can move it to another thing 
the solidarity the struggle for others that is always doing by the tribals thank you sir thank you for the question and maybe we will take it up for one last question any questions from the online participants one last question kindly be brief also no question seems to be no question okay i request our bishop to kindly help us to clarify the queries that are raised by our dear friends thank you so much for your interest in the paper let me once again confess that uh, i have uh, become an academic invalid for the past uh, one decade i am out of touch with what is happening in the academic world and uh, your principal dr sangram baskari made me once again alive by trusting this responsibility on me and he has graciously sent me so much of material to prepare this paper thank you once again with that background let me try to answer what you have raised first of all uh, to the daughter of uh, bishop minch can we have our own identity or should we have an umbrella identity term all of us have our own identities for example i am a mala that is whatever name i carry whatever status i carry whatever academic ability i, I have achieved in the eyes of the people i am a dalit finish that is my identity i cannot come out of that with my achievements so then there are hundreds of sub castes within the dalits yeah i am i am proud to be called as a mala but is there a umbrella term so that all of us can unitedly fight against the discrimination can we collectively come together to fight against the atrocities so for me for that mission we need a kind of an umbrella term to identify ourselves then uh, coming to dr bowas what he has said is a guru dakshina for my teaching very kind uh, words it's true that uh, there is a flexibility there is a fluidity and there is a plurality in uh, identity and therefore if that is the case if we accept the flexibility fluidity plurality if you accept that reality how can there be an identity crisis that itself an identity crisis see take for example an ant an ant is its identity but it gathers food so can we call it as gatherer as its original identity no we only call it as an ant as its original identity gatherer is an alternative identity or an adjective or whatever it is so therefore as long as we have problem with our core identity all the other is acquired identities are imposed identities as long as there is problem 
with our core identity, then the, it is called the identity crisis. That's how I understand it. But you may be right in your own thinking. Anyway, thank you for raising that one and all the others should be able to answer that one. Caleb. Thank you. Naxalites is a chosen identity. That's what you have very clearly said. Naxalites is a chosen identity because they want to work for the emancipation of those who are oppressed. That's a chosen identity. Let me emphasize, that's a chosen identity. But what is the original identity of the member of the Naxalite gang? He or she might have an original identity. So if there is a problem with the original identity, then it is an identity crisis. I don't mind calling myself an ex light as long as I stand in solidarity with those who are oppressed by people. That is a different mission altogether. I am branded as an ex light. Nax light is a given name. Nax light is a chosen name. But there is an original identity for the person. So if that identity is affected, if that identity is shadowed with the multiple identities, then I would say it's a identity crisis. And uh, whatever uh, Dr. Sundar Singh, my uh, brother, is identity necessary? If yes, give your argument. If no, give it all. It's a question for the academic uh, examination. Identity for me is very necessary. See, if I don't have an identity, see, I have an acquired identity today because I was a former teacher. And therefore, Gurukul has considered me to deliver this lecture. If I don't have that identity as a former teacher, then they would not uh, come to me at all. They would not remember me at all. See, that is an acquired identity. But my original identity, I belong to a particular caste group. My father was a, a revenue officer. And uh, to discharge his responsibility, he was given a jeep. That time it's jeeps for the revenue department. I, my mother, my sisters, my father, all went to his ancestral village. When we stopped at our ancestral place, somebody going on the road inquired with somebody else, who is that fellow riding on the jeep? The answer of the other person is, oh, that fellow is a Dalit. His status is forgotten. His achievements are forgotten. The only thing people has in their minds registered is that fellow is a untouchable. Finish. That is the given identity. But I would proudly say that that is my, untouchable is my identity. But not that. God has given me a definite identity that is human being. Human being is my identity. That's what you talked about post-colonial and whatever arguments here. Human being. Why? Forgive me for venturing into Dalit studies. Why Dalits have accepted gospel or why the Adivasi or tribals have accepted gospel? Because of that unique, valuable message that people are created in the image of God and therefore all are equal. That is the message that uh, transformed us. So identity for me is the original identity that we have inherited from our parents, from our societies from our communities. So therefore, for yes, I have so many arguments, but I need 10 papers to fill that one. Thank you so much. Uh, then, uh, do we need to have a collective uh, umbrella identity? I said, yes, we need to have for uh, the sake of fighting. Then, uh, shall we give up our Christian identity? 
why should we give up our kitchen and so some uh, uh, assemblies some congregations argue that when you become a Christ, uh, christian when you become a christian why do you want to carry the baggage of dalit or this uh, hindu or reddy or tamma why do you want to carry that baggage why don't you simply be called as a christian it's true the argument is true i believe in christ he is my liberator and therefore i am christian but before that what was my pain what was my suffering what was my status in the uh, society i want to tell to the whole society i am a dalit then i am have become a christian transformed into christian because of the love of christ so i want to carry both this as long as i live i want to carry that i am a dalit that's why bishop min says garav se kaho my adivasi hu with pride you say that you are an adivasi with pride i would say that i am a dalit so that is needed for me then uh, yes uh, uh, mrs min start of said uh, say whenever i go when people ask who are you i am a kuru very well said justified accepted but then oppressed people come together to fight against the discrimination oppression suppression and land alienation all these things what is the term for these fighters all these people with rebellion in their heart those who seek justice equality so for me yeah i am a mala that's justified absolutely but then i am a dalit brings in others into that collective identity and fighting together in solidarity thank you so much thank you bishop for helping us to understand more clearly for giving further clarification on identity crisis and identity awakening uh, friends now let's have a ppt which brings the memory of our bishop nirmal mins i request the gltc media to kindly assist us in this over to gltc media sharing us the beautiful life and witness of our bishop uh, nirmal mins and now we'll have a special prayers i request reverend dr 
Nagriya Samuel sir, our register of Gurukul, to pray for the family members of Bishop. <laughs> Let us look to the Lord and pray. God of grace, God of love, we thank you and praise you for the beautiful day of our late Bishop Dr. Professor Nirmal Min's birthday. Thank you, Lord, for his life. Thank you, Lord, for his contribution to the community, the church, and the society at large. Lord, as the theological community of Gurukul, he remember his contribution towards the theological education in India, particularly in the field of the tribal theology, and particularly the contribution to the primal religious studies in India. Not at this time, we pray for Bishop, late Bishop Dr. Prof. Nirmal Min's wife, Mrs. Paraklita Min's. Thank you Lord for her shouldering all the family aspects when Prof. Min's was fully concentrating on the the academics and the church relation matters. Thank you, Lord, for her commitment to the church and the society. And thank you, Lord, for her contribution to the family also. Lord, at this time, we pray for Professor Nirval Min's daughters. Sonas Haria means he is the Vice Chancellor of Siddho Kanho University, Dumka, and her contribution to the academia in India, and her husband, Reverend Dr. Patuel Etka. Lord, you be with them as they continue to contribute to the academic circle and in the church relations. Lord, you be with them and you bless them. And we also pray for Dr. Shanti Dani Mins, Professor of Community Medicine and HOD of Rusha Department at the CMC Vellu. And also her husband, Dr. Atul Thank you, Lord, as they contribute to the health care of the famous institution of a CMC, Vellur. Lord, you be with them and you bless their ministry as they carry forward the legacy of Dr. Mins in their given situation, particularly in the health care ministry. Lord, we also pray for Reverend Dr. Nitzhar Chakriya Mims and her husband, Reverend Dr. Jakmak N. Ekka, as they contribute in the theological circle in the U.S. Lord, you be with them and you bless their all their endeavors and they continue to serve you in the given context. We also pray for Mrs. Akai Chakriya Mins, who is the state coordinator of NRHM 
at Jharkhand state and her husband, Mr. Sanjay Kaka, as they continue to serve the people, those who are in Jharkhand, Lord, you be with them and you bless them. We pray for all the grandchildren, the nine grandchildren of yeah. Professor Nirmal Mins. Lord, you be with them and bless them. Help them to carry forward the legacy of Professor Nirmal Mins. Lord, we as a Gurukul family, the extended family of Professor Nirmal, help us to carry forward the the bold theological vision which is entrusted to all of us so that we may serve you and the serve the people in our country who are at the grassroots levels. Lord, help us so that we may also contribute in the days to come, as the Professor Mins has contributed in the church and in the society. Lord, you be with us and you bless us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. And I request Reverend Dr. Edwin Jibrai, sir, Professor in the Department of New Testament, to offer a special prayer for the Adivasi Christians who are undergoing persecution in India. Okay, maybe we can take up the prayer later. And now we request our dear principal, Reverend Dr. Sundaram Basmatari, to give us the special announcement. And I also request Dr. Giri Krishnan sir to kindly come forward for the release of the Guru Kid Journal. Uh, dear friends, good afternoon. I'm so delighted to stand before you in order to introduce our latest uh, issue of Google Journal of Theological Studies. And it is ready for release. Uh, it is the 28th volume, issue number two. We are supposed to release it uh, towards the end of the last year, but uh, due to various reasons, we could not do it. Uh, we were hoping to have the ISSN number incorporated for this issue. Somehow we came to know that uh, immediately it is not possible in the near future, it is going to be done. So we thought to release this uh, journal at this time and also maybe in the future, next issue, uh, we'll, link, we'll have the ISSN number as well incorporated in the journal. Uh, this uh, Google journal, uh, for this issue, we have adopted the college theme, Embracing Diversity. Many of the articles which are incorporated in this journal, included in this journal, are dealing with this particular theme, Embracing Diversity. We are so grateful to the principal and also the uh, Gurugul board for uh, giving us this freedom as well as to helping us with the finance to uh, release this journal regularly. We are, in fact, every year we are uh, releasing two journals, two issues of the Guru Journal uh, without any uh, kind of break. So for this second issue of this uh, Guru Journal, volume number 28 is having seven articles contributed by our own faculty members, uh, Reverend Dr. Shanti Sudha Monika, Reverend Dr. Edwin Jevaraj, 
Around Dr. Nagesh Swami, Around Dr. Wilson Paluri, Around Dr. Daniel Kirbaraj, Around Dr. Samuel Sondaraj Singh, uh, Reverend Jivaraj Anthony, all these uh, great scholars have contributed the articles for this particular issue. We are thankful to each and every one of the contributors, as well as Reverend Dr. Vinos Silas for the book review as well. We have the privilege of inviting our uh, our chief guest, right, Reverend Dr. Sunil Banu, to release this uh, journal. I may I request this time to invite him to release the journal. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I dedicate this journal for the glory of God and for the benefit of the readers and to remember in their prayers the mission and vision of Gurukul. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gri Krishnan, sir. With much struggle, you made it all the possibility to release the journal today. Congratulations to the team. And now I request our dear principal, sir, to kindly make an announcement. In continuation to information sent yesterday over community group, <laughs> as we celebrate the birthday of Dr. Mins through this endowment lecture, who stood for the cause of the Adivasi and tribals of uh, particularly Jharkhand now, and then it is enter Santal Parganas. So we felt that we extend helping hand as in Satishgarh, 18 villages, Christian villages, our own believers, in Naranpur and 15 villages in Kandagaon are completely removed from their villages. Now they are in the relief camps. Of course, other places also similar case, but that 18 plus 15 villages at hand are in very pathetic conditions. Very chill winter now also. No proper shelter, no regular food supply, no sanitary facility, quite a lot of struggles. And different agencies are organizing uh, for fun just to help them directly. So we also came across uh, that kind of mobilization. So we request faculty and then all the student body extend generous hand, whatever small amount we can collect, we will be sending directly to a particular location. We cannot cover. We will identify which congregation or what purpose will be suitable to send it. We will do that, but we will be collecting that contribution. You are welcome to contribute generously, and then class-wise, and then for, for, uh, for faculty members, maybe our faculty council secretary will organize. We will keep uh, collecting these contributions. So I request all the community members to extend helping hand so that we can stand in solidarity with these persecuted Christians in Satiskar in particular. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the announcement and taking initiation in helping the suffering people. And now I request Roland Dr. Erwin Jabra's sir to offer a special prayer for Adivasi Christians who are undergoing persecution in India. <laughs> Uh, I think sir is not here. I will close for a second. Shall we pray? 
gracious Lord, we thank you for giving us the privilege to pray for Radhivasi friends who are enduring hardships and suffering due to their faith in you. And Lord, we know that they are our brothers and sisters belong to the body of Christ. And we are one in God's family. For believing in you, for their faith convictions, they are going through a lot of hardships these days. So God, we pray you be their protector protecting them from all harms and dangers that the enemies of the gospel are trying to inflict upon them. So God, strengthen each one of them in their difficult times that they may continue to walk in your footstep, cling on to you and grow in their faith in you and be a great witness that the persecutors will, O oh God, be brought into the saving knowledge of Christ. We also pray that those who persecute them, Lord, will be confronted by the Spirit of the Lord, the power of God, that they will turn from their evil ways and learn to love, Lord, the persecuted ones as their brothers and sisters. We pray, O oh God, that together they may glorify your name. And together they may experience the kingdom of God. Lord Jesus, come in their midst that your name may be glorified and exalted. And we thank you for giving us the wonderful privilege to, Lord, identify ourselves with them in their struggles and uphold them, Lord, in our prayers that you will, Lord, bless them and protect them and guide them and lead them. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Thank you, sir. And I request Dr. Mary Kapp, Madam, to kindly lead us in closing prayer and benediction. Let us pray. Our merciful God, we thank you for this meaningful endowment lecture. We thank you for your presence throughout this program. We thank you for your abundant love and care for us. Oh Lord, may you continue to fill us with your wisdom and compassion for others in this world of such turmoil and fearful at times. We pray as a church, to help us to stand in solidarity and to stand against the violence that is meted out to the people and communities around us. We pray for your guidance and strength in advocating just, justice mm -hmm. and inclusion. We ask all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us receive benediction. May the love of God rest and transform every. Adivasi, every tribe and every nation and eradicate all barriers that divide people group in, into gender, caste, creed and colors. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ abides in the heart of the faithful to forgive one another and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit guide us in seeking justice and peace now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. Now the convener of the endowment lecture, Reverend Dr. Langley Lanyani Prasanna, ma'am, will deliver the word of thanks. Um, thanks. I know we are all hungry, but food is getting ready. But I just heard this cooker's uh, whistle only now. So we can still spend some more time. I don't know how brief I should be. Uh, uh, already I'm getting hints, please be brief. Uh, but I don't know. Let me see. Let me try. 
and I'll start with uh, our moderator. Thank you, Reverend Joyce Esther, uh, for that excellent uh, uh, leading of this entire program. So much of confusion here. Only we both know, no, but you have managed excellent. Thank you so much. And um, I thank our principal, uh, Dr. Songram Basmatari. Um, as usual, I always uh, feel so good to thank him and for his uh, help all the time he's there. So thank you, sir, uh, even now. And I thank um, our bishop, Dr. Sunil Banu, for being with us in, and for uh, such an enriching um, presentation. The very um, short time uh, you did so well and um, you developed conversations and you helped us to think through. Thank you so much. And thank you, Bishop, for being with us. We are so proud. Thanks to uh, Dr. Jacob Sundar Singh for that a very good response. And you re read the paper and then you have posed a lot of questions for thinking. Thank you so much. And all those who have actively participated raising questions, uh, thank you. Uh, and all the participants who are here physically and also online. And I especially acknowledge and thank the family members of Bishop Nirmal Mins. Thank you. And also um, Nisa, daughter of uh, uh, Nirmal Mins, who spoke to us. And I thank her. And very special thanks to GLTC media team, and especially um, Dr. Samuel Saundar Rasing, and also the convener of um, the Fine Arts uh, Committee, uh, Reverend John Pradeep. And they did everything in the last minute yesterday, all these arrangements and everything. Although I told them very late, they skipped their meals and they started working on. Thank you so much, uh, my colleagues and friends. Thanks a lot. And also to um, Chapel Stewards uh, for all your help, for all these arrangements. And again, once again, I thank our principal, Dr. Sogram Basmatari and the accounts department, our treasurer, Dr. Joshua Peter and acting principal, Dr. Malvin Shinoj Boas for approving our budget. Uh, and thanks for that good lunch that you have uh, uh, allowed us uh, that we are going to have. Thank you so much. And thanks to our friends who gave special songs and uh, quiet team and then that video presentation and, uh, and all those friends who helped us in prayers. Thank you so much. And I want to uh, give a special thanks to our administrative staff all the time they are there with smiling face. Every time when we approach them, in the last minute, we go so many changes. Please change this, change this, change this. But they're always there. Thank you, friends. And also thanks to MESS team uh, for providing us good tea with biscuits and also lunch. And, um, and finally, um, I thank uh, the committee members of um, Endowment Lecture, Dr. Songram Basmatari, Dr. Peter Singh, uh, Dr. Jacob Sundar Singh, Ms. Uh, Rebecca Asraya. Thank you very much. It's always a joy to be with you and to work with you, dear friends. As this is the last Endowment uh, Lecture for this year, I want to uh, really thank for your contributions and your support. You know, the program that we have planned in the committee meeting is entirely different. The one which we have now is entirely different actually, except a few things, completely changed. But I could not uh, consult the committee members, but I thank you. And that freedom I could exercise because of their friendship and because of their confidence in me. Thank you, my dear friends. And I thank Dr. Giri, Although in the last minute that uh, somehow he was able to manage to release our Gurukul journal, 
Thank you, uh, Dr. Giri, and also Bishop for releasing it. And um, thanks to all of you. I don't think I would have missed. Um, I don't think I missed anyone. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. God bless you. Have a good lunch. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, ma'am, and the entire uh, committee, Endowment Lecture Committee, for organizing all the Endowment Lectures for this academic year. And I for all your presence and active participation. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you all. तो संजय भारत अच्छा मेरा इसको इसको मैंने बड़ा इसको मचाना है